Hey guys, you're listening to episode 226 of The Modern Acre. This week we talked to Pablo Borges, who's the CEO and founder of Produce Pay. Founded by growers for growers, Produce Pay's vision is to make fresh produce accessible to all. Produce Pay is an ag tech startup committed to building a better supply chain for fresh produce, one that places trust at the center of every transaction. It is the fastest growing provider of capital, market insights, and trade protection from the fresh produce industry. Produce Pay has the mission of strengthening relationships between growers, shippers, retailers, and consumers of the fresh produce in the United States and Latin America. You're listening to the Modern Acre Podcast. Every week, you'll hear from the entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders that are changing the food and agricultural industry on and off the farm. Your hosts are Tim and Tyler Nuss. They are brothers, fifth-generation farmers, and entrepreneurs who have scaled tech startups, developed international supply chains, and built brands. The Modern Acre is ag built different. Hope everyone had a great Memorial Day weekend, long weekend. We're recording this on Memorial Day because, you know, work never stops. Um, But Tim, hopefully you had a chance to relax over the long weekend. What were you up to? Yeah, first off, for our listeners that are veterans, thank you for your service. A really cool day. Tyler and I, both of our grandparents were World War II veterans, so definitely a a special day for the family. But yeah, it was a good weekend. We stayed close to home. We started the weekend with a barbecue on Friday night with some friends went mountain biking on Saturday morning, went to our cousin Brad's farm and played poker Saturday night. Yesterday we had an engagement party and today we're kind of taking it easy. We did the Murph workout this morning and then we're just going to lay low this afternoon and barbecue tonight. So pretty awesome three-day weekend. What about you, Ty? Yeah, pretty full weekend. Poker at the farm. I mean, it's not something you, you hear every day. Yeah, he does it every quarter. They raise money for charity. So it's a pretty good time. I made it to the final table, but didn't make the final cut to get paid out. But in any case, a super fun time. That's awesome. No, our weekend was good. We uh, we took it pretty low. Had some friends over, did some barbecuing. So that was that was great. And now, yeah, gearing, gearing up for the week. I unfortunately did not do Murph this year, but um, maybe next year I'll work up to it. It's uh, it's definitely a big undertaking. It's okay, Ty. Uh, you know I'm the best athlete in the family, so it's okay that you uh, took the year off this year. Yeah, happy to compare times anytime you want, Tim. Let's just let's just look at the scoreboard, okay? Like let's look at the numbers. <laughs> Well, guys, we have a really awesome episode for you this week. We talked to Pablo Borges, who's the CEO and founder of Produce Pay. Pablo has over 20 years in the, in the ag industry. He's born into a fourth generation farming family from Mexico. Pablo grew up around the family farm, Campus Borges, and has experience throughout the supply chain. He launched Produce Pay in 2014. So it's just a really fun conversation about his family background in farming, taking learnings from the farm and really building a company around it. They've been at this quite a while, and it's cool to see them add new products and features along the way. Hey, Pablo, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me, guys. Very excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to talk to you and learn more about Produce Pay. But before we jump in, maybe let's start with the world's financial markets, obviously being focused on the finance side of the produce industry. How are you looking at what's happening in the markets right now? The markets are in flux. It's not like we haven't seen this. We just went through this two years ago. But I mean, this time it feels different. Last time during COVID, you know, we used a lot of quantitative easing to kind of ease our 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 our, our, our short term concerns, but that's kind of what got us into trouble this time around. So, uh, it feels different this time. It feels like we're going to have to let the economy sober up the good old fashioned hard way, and um, and that's very top of mind, right? That's that's keeping me and I'd say probably every other founder out there awake right now because we don't know what to expect, and and um, and we're just wary and, and ultimately cautious of what's to come. The reason why this is very relevant is we have to think about about the initiatives that we launch right now because it, 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 we we can both benefit or detract the industry from trying to do something right now if there's too much noise and the markets are not ready to listen, right? So let me give you an example. We're about to launch um, our decarbonization strategy, which might just be the world's first large-scale produce decarbonization strategy, but we're also thinking, is this the right time to do it? Like, are the markets ready to hear right now, or are the markets too worried about variability, right? So our plan during COVID was to just keep our heads down and focus on an industry that people need it, because people still need to eat. We're probably going to do the same this time around, make sure that we're there for farmers when they need us, but we are timing some things to understand, like, we have a great, we have a lot of great initiatives, but is this the best time to launch them when the world is to like to your point, maybe bothered or maybe phasing out a lot of things given the noise that exists in the markets. 
I, I find it just super fascinating, right? And like our, our generation, we're experiencing this, you know, market volatility for often for a lot of us for the first time, right? Like being being professionals. And I, I, I find it very interesting, the the wartime CEO context, right? Of like, how, how do you how do you reframe and adjust how you're positioning your business and what products, features, programs, like you're mentioning, do you prioritize or deprioritize because of that? So I, I find it really interesting, and I think it's top of mind for for a lot of us. But Pablo, want to want to take a step back, uh, learn a little bit more about you. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and and why you're why you're in agriculture. From what I know about you guys, I think we're in agriculture for the same reason, right? It's in my blood. I, I, I was born to a fourth-generation farming family out of northwestern Mexico. I've been in the industry my entire life, and specifically, my family was always in food and vegetable farming. So very, very, very specifically focused to to what we at Produce Bay do as well, right? Um, but then also after I left my family farm, I had the opportunity to meet hundreds of farmers from like six different countries before launching Produce Bay. And really two things became clear to me. One, that this industry was not adopting technology like other industries were. Um, market and pricing opacity, this aggregation, excessive intermediarism, and maybe a complete lack of like supply chain transparency were the norm. Um, maybe to throw some facts out there, like the average piece of produce, the American, the, like the average American consumed travel 1,600 miles, is handled by four to eight different people, rebranded twice and marked up three to six times. Like it's completely untraceable. Um, and, and this results in a lot of food waste and, and, um, and, and, and the numbers can sometimes be shocking, right? When I tell people like they, they, they always have a double take, but I don't know if you know this, but of, of every piece of produce, of 10 pieces of produce that leave a farm, four never get consumed by a client. Like that's massive. That means that 40% of, of the product that leaves a farm will ne- will never actually get to be to feed somebody out there and when the world faces poverty and hunger issues like they do today this amount of failure is not just is not just daunting it's also unacceptable and and, and honestly I wanted to help like as somebody that had come from the from the industry um, or somebody that had come of age during like the dot com era I, I firmly believe th- that the produce industry could also be digitized, that it could be revolutionized by technology. And I felt the responsibility in some ways to be you know, one of the people that helped drive that change. And that's kind of what kept me in the industry, if that makes any sense. What an awesome story and pretty fascinating st- statistics alongside that. Pablo, maybe walk us through kind of the early days of, of you kind of coming up with the idea of produce pay and really getting it off the ground. What were those early days like and the origin story for getting produce pay started? I mentioned to you guys how um, how I kind of left the family farm to go and meet farmers across six different countries. After I had that opportunity, I I, um, I, I then decided, you know, I made the decision that I wanted to stay in the industry, right? Um, I got to meet a lot of farmers from all over the world, and I said, like, I like I like the people that I'm that, that I'm kind of working with. I like what farmers stand for. I like the call it the nobility of the industry, right? And and and. So after that time, I went to an MBA at Cornell that's got a really good act school. Um, and, you know, I, I came up to my teachers and I said, like, hey, I've just spent the last four years um, meeting farmers and I see all these issues that are happening. Um, and, and you know, I told them, like, listen, I, I think I think somebody needs to do something about this. And, and they were like, why don't you do something about this? And I said, and I said, what do you mean? And I was like, you're an entrepreneur, right? And, and, and I said, I don't know, am I? And they were like if you're really passionate about solving as you are. So it was funny. Cornell really, really kind of, I didn't know anything about like venture capital markets. I didn't know anything about like the, the, the modern sense of the world entrepreneur until I got to Cornell. And then they really, they really said like, listen, based on what you've told us, based on the things you want to do, like it really does seem you need to go in this route. Uh, but it didn't make it easy for me, right? Like they, they signed me up for all these like pitch competitions and they made me go through all of them. And, and luckily we did really well on them. And, and that's how I was able to raise like the, the, the initial monies by which we launched Produce Pay. But yeah, I mean, honestly, it was a, it was both a, it was the intersection of having been born to an industry that I felt passionate about and, and wanting at, at a time when the industry, when the world was digitizing and felt and feeling compelled to be part of that change myself, but also being in the right place at the right time, right? I happened to be in one of the universities with one of the big act schools in the world, um, and and I happened to to meet teachers and peers that really, you know, incentivized me to to to, to step up and 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 to be part of that change. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's serendipity combined with a, a long generational line of farmers uh, just trying to push the fold. So, tell us a little bit more about 
produce pay and kind of your go to market strategy and your your model? How does produce pay work? And how do you interact with farmers in the industry? What produce pay does is that it effectively helps farmers digitize their upcoming crops as a way for them to gain tools to better trade it. So ultimately, what that means is that we work with farmers directly to help them underwrite the future crops they will one day produce. And then by doing so, uh, we bring that future volume into our platform. And from there, they can do all kinds of things. So these things include, for example, monetizing part of that crop ahead of time. So they can make the investments to get that crop to fruition in this case, literal fruition. Uh, but also by, by putting that volume into our platform, they can immediately have off takers, which can be anywhere, anywhere from wholesalers to retailers to all kinds of middlemen bid against their pro- their product, bid against their crop, and then allow farmers to start optimizing their, their upcoming crops, um, sales strategy ahead of time uh, because ultimately what we found that um, that hinders people's ability to really maximize crop or leads to that 40% food waste that we mentioned is is the, the, the push strategy nature of farming that exists today where you farm something and you put it out to the market. The more you know where that product is needed and where it needs to go, the, the more you can reduce food waste, right? And I would say if I had to really say what a base competitive advantage is, I would say that it's been our ability to understand and underwrite an asset class that nobody else was willing to, to touch. And, and what I mean by that is like perishable biomass. So in short, we can assess and successfully capture the value of a future yielding perishable piece of produce. The reason why people historically weren't able to do that is because the perishability aspect of it made it completely uncollateralizable in the way that non-perishable ag is. For example, like any kind of grain, like wheat or like soy or even non-grains like cotton, these commodities can be can be collateralized because they, be, they they can be kept indefinitely. Produce cannot. So when you add that perishability, you can't really build the capital markets under it. What we did is we actually found a way to do that, right? And by doing so, um, we were able to give farmers access to capital in a way that they had never seen before, which made us very popular with farmers. And two, we were able to successfully compel them um, to upload their future crops to our platform as a means to gain access, not just to the capital, but also to the off takers a bit against their product. And this is really what sparked the virtuous cycle uh, th- that led to the, the network effects that is, that really you, you wish to have in a marketplace, right? So to a degree, like, we gave farmers something they, they needed that to, to the first farmers did not have. And by doing so, we helped compel a group of people that is sometimes reluctant to use technology to actually give us a shot at uploading their future crops and then let us not just help them monetize them, but also sell them ahead of time. Super interesting. I love that you're kind of carving out this new space, like you mentioned, that the grain crops, ha- the grain crops have futures and indexes against them, that there's financial tools available for the the growers that are farming commodities, but for fresh produce, produce that doesn't really exist. So carving out like a totally new category here is, is really cool. And then tapping into the marketplace component as well, giving growers more optionality to find better channels to distribute their goods. I'm sure there's a huge learning curve getting growers on board of the platform. You've talked about digitization and just kind of the challenge that some growers have adopting technology. What have been some of the challenges and learnings along the way getting the platform started? I think the biggest insight or learning that we've had is that what actually drives the industry to disintermediation may not be pricing or margin optimization per se, um, but what we believe will actually end up driving this market to disintermediation are latest consumer trends for sustainability. And let, and let me explain what I mean by that. Consumers have made a very, very conscious and very explicit choice to demand product that, that they can ultimately know how it was grown, right? Whether it's like socially responsible, uh, environmentally sustainable. And because they've begun demanding these things with such fervor and voting with their wallets so aggressively, they've now pushed retailers to make explicit commitments to their shareholders and their consumers that they're going to achieve this. But in truth, the current supply chain has no real means of achieving this given lack of transparency. Um, so for the longest time, we always thought the best way to compel people to come together is going to be by offering better margins, by offering less intermediaries. 
But ultimately, what we're realizing that's actually resonating is that when we're approaching these end buyers now and we're asking them to take part in the industry, um, what really compels them to move away from the status quo is the fact that if they're able to source directly from farmers and do so through a platform like ours where you can actually audit the farm's practices on a monthly basis, where like somebody from our team actually goes and takes soil samples and actually... um, goes out there and like and audits like everything they're putting into the ground, then they re- you really start getting them excited. Um, because now you've actually proven to them that you can actually create a sustainable way to proving to their consumers the growing practices of the people that we work with. And that's really changing the tune of these retailers and how they're and how they're allowing us to work with them. So in short, like the only way to keep the grower accountable to sustainable farming practices is it's through a transparent and direct supply chain. And that is what's really promoting behavior far more than the promise of future of like immediate gain and far more than the promise of, of, of like cutting out middlemen. Um, and that's why about two years ago, we, we, we decided to really start doing our own initiative, which is called sustainably sourced. And I'll mention to you guys earlier that uh, we're now launching the, the, the world's first produce-oriented decarbonization strategy um, that, that is like the last leg of our sustainably sourced movement, right? And, and that's really how how we're promoting our marketplace now is through our ability to achieve not just efficiency, but also accountability and transparency in how produce is sourced. That's awesome. And th- that's kind of wh- where I want to head next is, you know, you've, you've had this, um, this business, you've been iterating on it, you've been ex- getting more customers, more retailers on the, on the platform. Like, where are you guys at right now um, in the business and kind of where are you headed over the next few years? Now that we've learned um, to successfully engage and digitize farmer supply, we're at a point now where we've gained a significant mass. Like Produce Bay, as of like, Today moves about three billion dollars of fresh produce. Um, our goal for the future is to offer is to offer the full suite of services that will allow farmers to sell to anybody uh, they want in the world. Right. So I mentioned that we we do about three billion dollars of produce that is sold across four continents today, um, and it's helped us become the fastest growing produce company in the Western Hemisphere. Um, our intent in the future is to work across globally and, and really uh, become the largest produce trader in the world, not simply for a matter of scale, because the truth is we don't count our size based on, on the traits that we do. We count the size based on the traits that our farmers do. So our intent really is to, is to leverage the network effects that come from joining a, a globalized network and then ultimately allowing these people to trade more efficiently. You also have to realize that our our desire to grow is not just fueled by our ambition to be you know, a big player in the industry. It's far more it's far more driven by the fact that it's the only way to really eliminate the forty percent of food waste and to really start tackling the real big issues of the world of world hunger, you have to have a perfectly efficient market. One where people actually know, like one where a farmer knows exactly where each of piece of fruit has to go based on the consumer's demands and request. And if you can achieve that, if you can really achieve a like a real pull strategy to the to, to like sourcing produce as opposed to a push strategy, then that's how you really eliminate uh, food waste, and that's how you really el- eliminate a lot of the the the, the, the problems of, of world hunger. Right? For the, for the longest time, um, people when Actix started, which wasn't that long ago, it was about 2015 when I think the first time I heard I heard the world the word Actec. But um, for the longest time in Actec, people always said that um, that the industry had a production problem. I, I, I don't, I mean, don't get me wrong, we could always be more efficient, but I, don't, I, I think a far bigger problem is a world's distribution problem because by simply redistributing the produce, the produce or food that we waste today, we could solve already most of the world's hunger. So what is the point of growing two times more, three times more product if a lot of that product is going to go to waste? We have to we have to first figure out and create the global network that connects the people that need the food with the people that are producing the food. And only when we can when when we can do that, and we can then re- redistribute the, the product that we grow today, can we then really worry about producing more? In my in my humble opinion. Super exciting stuff. Love where you guys are going and excited to watch you in the future roll out some of these new products and services. Well, Pablo, we'd like to switch gears here and zoom out a little bit. What's your ag hot take? 
my ag hot take is that the only way to truly bring this industry to the 21st century is by compelling farmers to digitize, regardless of how daunting the task seems. Digitizing intermediaries alone, which is what most of other startups do, will never be a holistic solution um, and will likely lead to farmers actually feeling more segregated. So really making sure that you digitize farmers at the farm level is what produce space idea or belief is that is how you really bring industry and efficiency sorry efficiency to these to this industry right and the reason why i said that's a hot take even though it may seem obvious is because this is very contrarian actually to the way that most people go about this space most technology companies in the space are digitizing the people that are doing most of the trading which are middlemen but what we find is that when you can't and it goes back to our earlier saying is if you can't digitize the farmers themselves and ultimately you're segregating the people that actually decide what is going to be grown and when it's going to be grown. So you can't really create efficiency without digitizing the people that decide what supply looks like, right? Um, and and that is a challenge because farmers are hard to digitize. Um, you know, farmers are traditionally traditional, part of the redundancy, and, and they're conservative folks. And normally, uh, they're much more wary of technology, which is why at Produce Bay, our goal has always been to have a very farmer-first approach. And what we found is that as new generations of farmers are starting to emerge, the appetite and thirst for technology is arising. And ultimately, it's about creating a journey, a path, and about giving farmers very clear and transparent solutions to what they are providing, and also very transparent, um, very transparent feedback as to how you're going to use their data. But if you're able to do that, then then the path towards digitization is happening. I'm not telling you that it, that is the fastest digitization that I've ever seen, but I can definitely tell you that it's progressing along in a way that makes me very optimistic about the future of this industry. Now, I find that super interesting. I mean, I think uh, your point is is a really good one. Of you know, it all comes down to data, right? And if we don't have really good uh, data at the farm level, then everything upstream will be uh, harder to solve. So I think exactly. that's I think I think that's really interesting. Pablo, what emerging companies or categories are you following closely, and why? We're following sustainability trends very closely. We need to find a common thread that will lead farmers and retailers to create a bond that would otherwise not exist, and one that is unique to them and equally rewarding to both, where the common theme is sustainability. Um, sustainability cannot be achieved through altruism. Expecting altruism to lead behavior leads to very poor business models. But if we allow sustainability to open doors for direct relationships, which will in turn free up margins that are currently lost to intermediaries, then farmers will immediately benefit from higher prices, where retailers will immediately benefit from their ability to give consumers what they want. Um, a piece of fruit that they can unequivocally prove was grown in a sustainable way, right? So those are the threads that we're really following because we believe, like I mentioned earlier, that the common thread that will that will finally unite, you know, big corporate retailers with mom and pop farmers um, or even large scale farmers for that matter is sustainability because it is something that they both parties, I believe, genuinely care for, you know, the best farmers that I've met are always very um, environmentally driven. Uh, they always care a lot about the land that they farm. And now retailers have become equally as driven by sustainability because their consumers have have made them care about sustainability. Um, and, and, and understanding how best to tie this thread between these parties and how best to leverage that to allow for direct interaction between these parties is what will immediately and unequivocally create the economic benefit that will create the ongoing incentive for these parties to follow that thread or follow that path towards completion, if that makes sense. Pablo, given the, the current macro trends and headwinds facing ag agriculture, what's your big prediction for the space in, say, five to 10 years? Um, I think ag tech will become far more attractive, not just to institutional investors like it did after COVID when people realized that necessity goods like food are often the most resilient industries. But as the world economies are tested during a time of geopolitical tension, I think countries themselves, especially the world superpowers, 
might actually begin competing against one another to secure food supply from these emerging economies, fueling massive investment and driving up food prices even higher. All right, last last question for this section. What's what's one of the biggest lessons you've learned in your career? I think entitlement is our generation's uh, biggest weakness. Um, we must be wary of it and make sure it doesn't get the best of us. And let me give you a story, a story where holding back my sense of entitlement actually made my entire career. After graduating college, which, you know, just for the sake of this example, you know, I was a very good college student, you know, graduated with honors from what arguably was the best university in Mexico. The first job for my first employer that was not my family um, was to help them source produce internationally. Um, but instead of doing that, they actually had me mop floors of the warehouses um, twice a day, every day, including Sunday, for three months. Um, not because they didn't think I, was, I wasn't I was worth a bigger job, but because they were testing me to see if I, if I had the humility that they would need somebody to have when they would send them to the farms all over the world. Um, they kept me doing this, like I said, for three months, during which time many people, including people in my very close personal circle, tried to convince me that such a function was honestly beneath me. But when my three months were over, I was given a new job. It was the opportunity to source from farmers across six different countries. And like, and like I mentioned to you guys earlier, this was the job that led me to get the insights that were the genesis behind Produce Pay, something that I would have never been able to do if, if I had let, you know, an inkling of entitlement get the best of me. So I think for all our virtues, um, I think we have to make sure that we never let any feeling that any kind of job is beneath us. Like one of the things that I love about this industry and I really love about farming is that farmers have historically for the longest time found a lot, a lot of genuine pride in just doing hard, honest work. And I think that's one of the best things that defines farmers is the fact that farmers have never seen work as something they don't want to do. Like, but they've always found pride in the work. And often the harder the work, the most grueling the work, the most, the dirtier the work, the more pride they find in it. And I think honestly that if I hadn't kept that virtue from my forefathers, I wouldn't be here today, right? So I think that's one of the things that, that, that I like to remind myself of often. I love that. That's such great advice. Well, Pablo, as we wrap up here, what's saving your life right now? What's maybe a product, habit, routine that's really helping you out? So I'm going to say my family first and foremost, because if I wouldn't and my wife ever, ever heard me say that, not say that, then uh, <laughs> she would have a word with me, but it's also very true. Um, I love my family. But having said that, um, video games, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an avid gamer. Um, I still, to this day, uh, even with the startup being as, like, as in my life as it is, I still stay up every Friday night uh, from, from like dawn until dusk. Uh, playing video games like I did 20 years ago. Um, and, and, and like, I still love it, right? So I think what I'll say is, and for all the people maybe that, you know, that are that have become adults in the past 10, 15 years, in the traditional sense of the word, where like they've had to get in jobs and do this, like don't let social norms dictate what you should like or not like. Like cartoons and video games are still my favorite pastime, just like they were when I was a child. Um, and the best thing about cartoons and video games is that in the grand scheme of things that people, that adults spend on, they're amongst the cheapest hobbies you can have. So I would say, like, if you like cartoons and video games and you find yourself questioning whether you can still, whether you should still like them, like, when you're 30, 40 or older, I would say, game on, my dudes. I love that. That's that, that's that's amazing. Um, yeah, I think video games are definitely cheaper than my my hobbies of like golf, for example. So uh, you're 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 onto something there. Well, Pablo, this has been a ton of fun. Really, really great conversation. Getting to know you and what you've been up to with Produce Pay. Uh, Produce Pay. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show. As we finish up, how can listeners get in touch and connect with you and Produce Pay? Our company can always be looked up. It's p r o d u c e p a y dot com. And my email is pablo at producepay.com. I always love hearing from people, especially people in the industry, but not necessarily so, right? So I would say if anybody has any hot take in the industry, if anybody has any ideas about how we can kind of make this industry more sustainable or any big ideas as to kind of how they or, or maybe their farmer friends are struggling to, to, you know, to farm more efficiently or to sell to better clients, 
I would say email us. Like we, we love hearing from farmers. We love hearing from people that want to make this industry better. And I think everybody at Produce Bay generally believes in what we're doing. And, you know, as far as startup missions go, like help, trying to help feed the world in a healthier way, I think it's as noble as it comes. So we welcome any and all ideas that can help us achieve that better. So thank you guys. And thank you for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure. So Ty, what do you think? Great chatting with Pablo. I think his, his lesson of entitlement, I think was really, really awesome of just like a reminder of we all could use a healthy dose of humility in whatever we're doing. And I, I love the his example of, of working at that job and having to mop floors or sweep floors and, and really what that taught him. And I think, you know, I don't think we all need to be sweeping floors, but I think just the attitude of humility, especially in agriculture, is is really worthwhile. Yeah, I love that mindset as well. I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode and had a great Memorial Day weekend. We've got a lot of good guests in the pipeline, so we're looking forward to releasing those episodes in the coming weeks. Talk to you soon.